I guess, are we recording yet? Okay. Are we on? Yeah. All right. Okay. So our next lecture is my co-organizer, Alex. Uh, Alex Mola. So uh, we promised this to you too much. We do have other lectures as well yeah. that you will see plenty of. <laughs> yeah, we'll actually announce the other lecturers, but I guess you've seen our faces so far. Okay, so this lecture, uh, not many equations shall be harmed. There will be a lot more equations in the next few lectures. But what I want to actually give you a sense of uh, in this uh, lecture is basically about the scale in scalable machine learning. Um, so the reason for that is because sometimes people, when they think about big data, they have ideas that are, let's just say, different from what you should think about in big data. And sometimes I've seen those misconceptions, not just with PhD students, but also with much more senior people. So what I'm going to focus on today is basically sources of data. And then I'll probably get to a fair amount of detail about architectures. So things like MapReduce, graph streams, the parameter server. Muli is going to give you a practical, uh, help you with practical sessions with a parameter server this afternoon and for the entire week. I strongly suggest that you go and attend this to actually try this thing out. Um, but basically, I'll just give you a slight advance preview and he'll go into a lot more detail. Um, what I'll then switch to is actually a number of models and algorithms how to solve those problems at scale. So we'll basically deep dive then into a select set of models, mostly topic models, and we'll do a bit of warm up with basically uh, logistic regression and so on. If we get to it, we'll look a little bit at randomized algorithms. Andrew Wilson is going to cover that a lot more also in his lectures, so in the context of fast food. And yeah, so this is sort of the outline of what we'll get to this week. Um, one thing is, if you have any questions, uh, please don't hesitate to raise your hands and ask while I'm teaching. And I'll take your question, I'll repeat it such that it's on the microphone, and then we'll take it from there. Okay. So now that I've killed enough time to give everybody a chance to come back to the lecture, let's actually start talking about data. So this is a picture you may or may not have seen. This is from 2012, and Domo.com produced this wonderful infographic. And they then updated it two years later. And what you should see is that most of those numbers are quite a bit bigger than before. Actually, a whole lot of those numbers are about a factor of two bigger than before. Um, you can look at that in a lot more detail on your own later on. But Basically, what you can see is that while well, people send about 200 million emails per minute, Google receives about 4 million search queries a minute, and there are about you know, 2.5 million Facebook shares, and you, know, that, I mean, you can read the numbers for yourself. But basically, there is an awfully large amount of data that's being generated every minute. So if your data set has less than, well, let's say, you know, you know, 2 million data points, it wouldn't even be able to handle what Facebook gets in a minute. Okay? So make sure your algorithms are actually scalable. So there's a big difference, by the way, between implementing something that then actually ran on, let's say, 10 billion data points and then an algorithm that is scalable. So the big difference between those two things is that an algorithm that is scalable at least has all the nice algorithmic properties of, well, possibly running on 10 or 100 or maybe 1,000 times more data. An algorithm that you've actually run on that amount of data, well, that has the advantage that you might have actually run into a whole lot of problems that you never anticipated. So for instance, one thing that happened to us when we uh, scale things up by a factor of 100 back at Yahoo, is that our switches started doing funny things, our network switches. And so all of a sudden, the algorithm actually slowed down a lot just because, well, 
there were some effects that we hadn't even thought of that we needed to deal with. So basically, be prepared to be surprised, usually unpleasantly, as you go up a few orders of magnitude, because problems will arise that you wouldn't e not even have thought of. Okay. So that's the difference between having a scalable algorithm and, and having it actually scaled. Okay. So now, where do some of those data sources come from that we really deal with? Well, here's one of my favorites. Um, so ambulance chasing is a popular thing to do in the United States. Um, so search for mesothelioma. It's a horrible disease that you get from asbestos mostly. And basically, it's an extremely lucrative thing for a lawyer to go and sue somebody who might have uh, you know, contaminated you with asbestos. And these are some of the highest paying ads in the United States. Different countries have different highest paying ads. And it actually pretty much goes by stereotypes that you might have about those countries. It's quite amusing when, when you see it. Um, in any case, if I search for mesothelioma, I mean, I'll see a lot of ads. And so now I need to decide, OK, first of all, you know, how many ads do I show? And I mean, this is clearly a lot. And if you search for something else, you'll see a lot fewer ads. So this is also called sponsored search, because they are not really search results. But it's not entirely irrelevant. So there are two things that really influence your position in this auction. So there's an auction being run. It essentially works very similar to eBay, where it's really the second price that you're paying. Basically, you're paying enough to outbid the, second, the next bidder. And basically, there are two factors. There's one thing that's basically the click probability for a given ad times the bid at this ad. It's actually a little bit more complicated because the position where you are in this list really determines also your click probability and so on. And there's also a little bit of pricing that happens in terms of externalities on that list. But essentially, it's that number where you need to use machine learning. So what you want to be able to do is to figure out, for a given ad, what are the chances that a particular user will click on it. Um, and this comes in at a fairly high rate. So as you saw, it's 4 million queries per minute. You need to actually be able to use this data to improve your estimates. And of course, you also need to predict at a rate of 4 million per minute. Okay, Here's something that has an even higher data rate. So emails are generated at about 200 million emails per minute. We want to spam filter. And what actually happens quite often is that those emails, well, most of them actually happen to be spam. And you want to pretty much hit them off right when they hit the uh, mail server. Because spam just wastes a lot of resources. It's really bad for a user if he sees spam. So it's quite an issue. On top of that, the entire data set is imbalanced because there's a lot more spam than ham. Furthermore, the loss is also imbalanced because well, suppose that the registration email for the summer school ends up in your spam folder. Um, you will maybe not make it to the summer school, right? So this is really bad. On the other hand, if I see a spam email in the inbox, well, I'll be slightly annoyed. But there's a very asymmetric loss and also an imbalance, as I said. And both things are actually skewed in the wrong way. OK. Um, so there's another example where you want to use machine learning. So the first two were basically classification problems. Um, here you have recommendation and ranking. And well, you can argue about the wisdom of why on earth uh, Netflix thinks that these are the movies that I like among classic foreign movies. OK, well, I mean, these are not, they are not bad. But I am fairly sure I'm not going to watch Barbarella. Um, <laughs> OK, maybe we can play it over lunch then. <laughs> Not sure how politically correct it is. Um, so uh, the, the point is basically that here the, your goal is not so much just to estimate a single probability, but you want to actually maximize the interaction probability for the whole page. And that's a very different goal. And uh, 
So you may actually argue that maybe that lineup isn't so great because, I mean, these three are actually, you know, in, in the same series that's basically all, uh, you know, those spaghetti westerns with Clint, Is Clint Eastwood. Um, so, and if I didn't like the first one, I might not like the second or the third. So there is, so you might actually not only care about relevance, but also about diversity in your search results, right? And yeah, this clearly also didn't do a great job because Ghidorah and Godzilla versus Mothra are very similar movies and there's another Godzilla movie. So somehow I seem to like, well, there's, there's even one more. So it's basically four Godzillas, three spaghetti westerns, and then um, other stuff. Does boats are actually quite good. Anyway, so the point is, you now have the issue of not just finding how relevant a movie is, but also generating a whole set of results such that at least the user is going to be interested in one of them. So there it's, it, so, so this is in a, in a way quite different. I mean, think of it like almost creating a menu in a restaurant. You want to make sure that you know, the guests find at least something that they like. Okay, here's another thing, and this is, I think, probably the most clear case why you should care about big data. So this is Google Trends, and okay, so one thing that you can see is, well, data mining is not a good career choice. Uh, machine learning, I think, is doing quite okay. If you do big data, um, you're going to be very popular. Now the question is, how will it continue, right? So you can kind of eyeball it and squint and then decide, okay, it's probably going to continue this way. Um, and well, I mean, I, I strongly believe that we're going, this is not the last that we've seen of this increase here. But the point is, now you have a time series and it's actually quite a different problem whether I ask you, well, can you extend this time series here to the right? Or if I you know, blot out one segment here, can you interpolate? So the big challenge is to really di uh, distinguish between interpolation and e extrapolation. Um, <clears throat> now, this sounds like a complete no-brainer. However, more than one paper has been written where, this where people made the mistake of essentially taking time series data, taking a random subset of that time series, and then trying to fill in the rest. And then they said, well, actually, hey, my time series predictor works really well. OK, so really, really, really big warning. If you do this, you must state so right pretty much in the, on the first page of your paper. right? And you shouldn't be doing that at all unless you have a really good reason for doing so. If you really want to show that you do well throughout, well, there's a very simple thing you can do is you can basically measure the forward prediction performance. In other words, you take the data up to here, predict the next step, then you take the data up to here, predict the next step, and keep on going. And this is then a much more realistic way of measuring how well your algorithm is doing. And of course, if you do that, don't train it up to here and then say, well, hey, I'm going to predict there, right? So careful. And this, as I said, sounds like a no-brainer, but I've seen a lot of papers where people made this mistake. So if the summer school serves for nothing else than to prevent you from making this mistake, it's good. OK, good. So now there's a lot more data that you can get. I mean, news articles and events. So you could, for instance, go and crawl the New York Times. And you can try aggregating things. So Spinner does that. Google News basically does a similar thing. It aggregates things, clusters, and then recommends. And if you look at the various ways how tabs are expanded and collapsed on Google News, you can imagine that some of this information might actually be potentially useful to infer whether you like some content. Right? So the idea there is uh, that you would use interaction data between you know, the website and the user in various gentle and not so gentle manners to actually infer whether the user liked the content. Because what's supremely annoying is 
if a website throws up a page and asks you, which things do you like? Well, I mean, that's, you know, it's okay maybe to do it once, but then actually what the user thinks that, well, that site understands and what the site actually understands by that data may also be different. So given that, it's much better to actually observe the user in the wild. Well, then there are things like blogs, microblogs, so Tumblr, Twitter, Weibo, and basically you can try to infer what users are interested in, where they are, when they go where, how they feel, uh, whether there's a flu outbreak. You can do a lot of interesting things just based on this microblog data. Um, reviews, so from that you can again infer what, let's say for instance, movies are about, you know, what the best places are, for instance, to have stake here in Pittsburgh. Um, well, you can, of course, also find out what good products are. But basically, there's a lot of user-generated content that you can sometimes, with a little bit of um, ingenuity, obtain. So sometimes you actually have to write a small crawler. Sometimes you have to make sure that this crawler doesn't crawl fast enough that somebody gets mad at you. Um, so. Uh, so there's a bit of engineering involved, but you can get that data. Well, comments, so there's a lot of stuff on YouTube, Reddit, their messages, well, they are probably the hardest to obtain because, you know, these are actually personal communications between people, and usually people get really upset if uh, everybody in the world can read their emails. Um, graphs, uh, some of them are actually crawlable. Um, sometimes uh, somebody releases stuff that they shouldn't have released, and then you need to search it. But so for instance, uh, yeah, there's like somewhere a Twitter graph floating around on the internet. Um, the Stanford Snap uh, website is actually a really good place where you can find a lot of them. Um, then there you have inform information diffusion networks. You have spatial temporal information. So for instance, where people check in at what time and so on. like. Foursquare, Twitter, so that Facebook. So these are all data sources that you can use. Not all of those data sources will be available to you from a university. In some cases, you actually have to go and do an internship at those companies. So if your interest is in a very specific data set, you should go and talk to people from those companies for an internship. And we actually have people here from a whole bunch of companies, uh, LinkedIn, um, Netflix, Microsoft, yeah, okay, part-time at Google. So there's a lot. But basically, if you're interested in any of the, and I think there are also some people from Amazon here. So if you want to work on some of those data sets, you probably will have to do an internship. Also because a lot of this data is generated by users who trust those places to treat their data confidentially. So that's why they would never be allowed to release this. And if you think about it, it's actually not that much different from a, you know, let's say a physicist who wants to study elementary particles. And he actually has to go to the, play, to the you know, accelerator where they smash the particles into each other to you know, do the measurements. And there's no way that you know, he could do it from the convenience of his desk he actually needs to go to where the measurements are being made, and there is only a small number of places where that facility exists. So, you know, think of this data as a scientific resource, like a scientific instrument. The other places where it's maybe not quite as tightly controlled, so for instance in bioinformatics, well, okay, that's probably still tightly controlled, but by now there's a fair amount of high throughput sequencing data that can be obtained in a microarrays, um, so you can probably get very substantial amounts of data there. In astronomy, the data rates are sometimes quite insane. So the square kilometer array, um, if you haven't looked for that yet, it's basically a large collection of essentially uh, radio telescopes which are operating in synchrony. And so you get the equivalent of a synthetic aperture radar device, but just with radio telescopes, which will give you a very large scalable telescope by which you can scan the entire sky. And it is 
essentially impossible at the moment to process all that data at once, so that's why they have to essentially focus it computationally. Uh, so the data rates there are really insanely high. In medicine, there is a lot of big data that's coming up. Again, this probably has a lot of privacy restrictions to it. Data to finance, uh, geophysics, so if you are interested in working on data obtained from seismic measurements, talk to me. Uh, we might have, be able to obtain some data from Exxon. Um, industrial process monitoring. So there's a lot of places where you can generate, log, store a lot of data that you can then afterwards model. So don't think about big data only being the internet. Uh, big data exists in a lot of places. Um, just if I haven't made that point clear yet, here's a more detailed list that you can later on peruse. But basically, big data is pretty much everywhere. Uh, important summary of that first part, um, and this is something that a lot of people get wrong. Expensive data is not the same thing as big data. It may be very, very expensive to generate a small amount of data just because, for instance, it involves a lot of people. So somebody in a panel, somebody very senior, told me, yeah, they have big data and they had, you know, 1,000 brain scans uh, of some very specific form and it was very expensive. And, well, okay, it fits on his laptop. That's very expensive data, but it's not big. Um, the second thing that you should also keep in mind is that big data does usually imply that you can design big models. So this is actually something that, for whatever reason, hasn't really entirely sunk in yet. So, I mean, in a, in a way, Zico already mentioned it in the previous lecture, where he said, well, you know, if I have more data, I can have more parameters. So if you actually, ex you know, extend the logic of that, it means if I have insane amounts of data, I should actually be able to build very sophisticated, complex, large models on this data. Because if I'm not doing that, I wouldn't actually need all that data to really, you know, to infer the parameters. So sometimes, um, I heard that very recently, somebody told me, yes, they have this very scalable system which can process many, uh, you know, terabytes of data. And by the way, they are exploiting the fact that the entire model fits into the level two cache of their processor. You do not want to do that. Basically, if you have that situation, you wouldn't need big data. Um, but that actually makes things doubly hard because you're getting a big model that may possibly be really hard to, you know, compute with, to reason with, to analyze, to control. And at the same time, you have a lot of data. So your model might not even fit into a single machine anymore. And this is where the fun begins because now you need to think about how can I actually distribute parts of the model on different pieces? How can I go and, you know, optimize in this case? How can I actually still perform model selection? Because you don't want your model to become too big such that you're overfitting. Because you can overfit on large data if your model is just way too big. Um, the last thing is, um, Big data does not come in isolation. In other words, you need a computer on which this thing sits. So you can't just say, well, here is my big data, and I'm now going to carry it to the big data analysis system. No, because that will actually cost you a lot more time and a lot more resources than actually solving the problem. Because the main bottleneck is really getting the data in and out of the systems. So if you haven't done yet, look at the prices, for instance, for Amazon or Google cloud services, and look at the price for actually data upload and download versus the prices for storage. And you'll see that actually getting the data in and out is the most expensive thing. So it's, in a way, a bit of a captive audience. So let's talk a little bit about the architectures on which such things run. Um, so. This is what a uh, server-centric Google looks like. 
Uh, no, the pretty lights there, I think they added some neon lights to make it look even prettier. But other than that, this is basically Google Server Center. And I think Facebook now hired the same photographer to generate very similar photos. So basically, look for Facebook Server Center and you'll see pictures that look stunningly similar. Um, again, with neon lights and all. So um, one thing to you know, start thinking about is, first of all, also is, well, you know, what do I have inside a single machine? Because if, you can actually, if your problem is small enough that it actually can be solved on a single machine, I would highly recommend that you do that and just worry about multi-threading rather than actually solving the multi-machine problem. Because multi-machine is a lot harder than multi-threading. So you have between 8 and 64 cores. You have about 2 to 3 gigahertz. You have a modest size of cache, 8 megabytes or so. And, and this is something that a lot of people don't even realize, you basically have a very highly parallel floating point unit in there. So what you should do is you should search for something called AVX instructions. So this is the latest version of vectorization from Intel. So why do you care about it? Because you get a factor of 10 speed up if you can actually use them. Um, so if you're programming in Java, you're kind of in an unlucky situation. Um, so basically, this is one of the reasons why I actually like C and C++. So if you've never heard about those, this, these instruction sets, you should actually check them out. Basically, means you can perform you know, eight floating point operations in one clock cycle on one core. And then you multiply that by, let's say, 16 cores, and you have a very high performance system. Um, Memory, well, everybody knows it's between you know, 16 and 256 6 gigabytes, sort of, kind of. And well, the latest numbers are actually quite impressive. You get about 100 gigabytes per second on a board. So this is for sequential access. Random access is at least 10 times slower. Um, why do you care about those numbers? Because, for instance, this means that dense linear algebra is going to be at least by a factor of 10 faster than sparse linear algebra. So use sparse matrices only if they are really sparse, because otherwise you're actually going to be faster and possibly more memory efficient using a dense matrix and just multiplying by it. Again, there are libraries like Atlas, which do a lot of the optimization for you. So before you do any of this, try to see whether somebody else has solved these problems for you. Uh, hard drives, well, everybody knows it's a couple of terabytes of disk. Uh, you get about 100 megabytes a second reading from the disk for a solid state drive. I mean, we are now looking at, for the really high end ones, about half a gigabyte a second. And now here's a puzzle. Why has the latency for hard drives not really decreased over the past few decades? Right? Everything else has improved, the data rates and so on. Why can't I really have less than 5 milliseconds latency on a 10,000 RPM drive? OK, any, suge any suggestions? Yes. Yes, the, the, the drive has to move around. And so if I want to access something else, and, the, and it takes the drive about 5 milliseconds to go around once, the platter button, then, well, I'll have to wait until, well, no matter how fast my head is, if, because I mean, there's basically a head moving along that disk. No matter how fast the head is, even if it was instantaneous, I'd still have to wait until the disk is back again. And that's why fast, so fast hard drives that rotate really rapidly will have, a slower, will have less latency. And they're amazingly noisy. So by now, most laptops actually have an SSD. Um, but you still need to actually care about those things because SSDs are still too expensive to store all the data. So when you design an algorithm, bulk reads are really your friend. Okay? So these are slides that are slightly dated, but I think some of the best information about what goes on in Google server centers and since it's a slide of Jeff Deans, nobody's going to complain about him releasing that information. Um, 
So you can look through the list eventually at some point offline, but basically a lot of things go wrong in a lot of different ways in a server center. I mean, that's really what this means. So you can occasionally lose, you know, entire racks of machines. And if your algorithms cannot cope with this, then you have a problem. So in other words, designing a scalable machine learning algorithm that cannot handle machine failure is doomed for failure as soon as you go beyond 10 to 100 machines. You may be able to run this in the comfort of your own server center. You know, maybe you know, at the university you have a cluster and you know, that cluster goes down only you know, every two months and maybe before that you know, the sysadmin gives you a call and says I'm going to take the machine down today. But if you actually run it in a real system, um, yeah, that's what you really have to worry about. Um, now, these are numbers that are really, really good. Try to memorize them if, at some point, or at least when you design an algorithm, do a back of the envelope calculation of how fast your algorithm should be based on those numbers. Okay. So what you can see here is, you know, there are orders of magnitude difference between various operations. If you ignore this, you're ignoring it really at your own peril. Because, you know, if I have to go and hit the disk to get certain information back, then, you know, my algorithm will all of a sudden be 100 times slower. So don't sweat the 10 to 20% improvements. Okay, basically you wait half a year, the processes are faster and, okay, it doesn't matter. But if you can get several orders of magnitude speed up by just being clever about your algorithm design, you should care. So a factor of 10 is important. A factor of well, 1.2, don't bother. And as you can see, doing stupid things here can very quickly wreck the performance. So if you've never used the profiler, Google what the profiler is and possibly even start using it. I know I'm getting some smiles here in the audience like, well, this is totally obvious, but I'm also seeing a couple of surprised faces like, what is a profiler? And I've definitely spoken to more than one person who asked me what a profiler was after I mentioned it. Uh, so test your code, measure actually where you're losing performance. Okay, good. So now, why do we actually care about going beyond a single machine? Well, the first thing is, well, we have a lot of data. So we might have between you know, 10 and 100 billion documents, like web pages, emails, ads, tweets. That, those are not unusual numbers. You might have between 100, and a, 100 million and a billion users on your online system. And so, for instance, you know, on YouTube, probably there's a million days of videos, and we are happily contributing to that with the summer school. Um, and there are probably about 100 billion images on Facebook. So that tells you that you need to be able to use multiple machines to actually process that data, because pretty much no matter how you design it, you're going to be working very hard if you want to process more than a terabyte per hour per machine. You know, maybe you can get that up to two or three terabytes. You can get special rigs where you put a lot of solid state drives in there and so on. But a terabyte an hour per machine is not an unreasonable ballpark figure. The second thing is we also have usually a parameter space for models that is too big to fit onto a single machine. That's the big data implies big models part. And so, for instance, if you want to personalize contents for content for many users, then, well, each user will want to have their own parameters, and if you have a billion users, then you need to have a billion of those parameter sets. And so you'll have to start worrying about, you know, how do you actually distrib distribute and store this? How do you ensure that when a user shows up, you have this data available readily? Um, so you have all sorts of partitioning issues and replication that you want to care about. And so basically, you have two parallelization challenges. One is to parallelize on many cores. 
And secondly, to paralyze on many machines. A lot of people ignore the first part. What they do, and it's amazingly stupid, is they will say, well, let's just run a lot of virtual machines on a single machine. Um, I know you laugh, but I've seen this in more papers than one. So don't do it. Because you're throwing away so much performance by just ignoring the fact that you have possibly 64 threads that are running on the same machine that are sharing the same memory. So take advantage of those two opportunities. The good thing is quite often you'll end up you know, first designing something that works well on a single machine anyway, and then you scale it up. So actually exploit the fact that it's multi-threaded. Um, bit of pricing. Um, so all of those systems are pretty good if you use them occasionally. So in other words, if you need a, need a lot of computation before your NIPS or your Wisdom or your KDD or your ICML deadline, Amazon and Google are your friends. If you end up using the machine at peak performance all the time, you're much better off having your own. So for instance, let's take something like a machine with 16 cores, 60 gigabytes of memory, then this amounts to about $10,000 a year. And Amazon and Google pretty much match each other's prices, so it doesn't really matter. For storage, it's a little bit different, but they have pricing strategies that are slightly incommensurate with each other, but they're about the same within an order of magnitude. Um, now, you might wonder, well, is there a cheaper way of getting those machines? Because this is expensive, right? $10,000 a year. Well, actually, it turns out you can. So there's something that's called a spot instance. And this is a figure that I got from Amazon. This is from, I think, a couple of months ago. And this is, these are basically spot prices for various server centers. So what this means is basically excess capacity that's not being used is essentially just essentially made available on, a, on an auction. And this means if you bid high enough, you get it. And if you bid too low, or if somebody else in, at some point bids higher, you'll just get priced out and your jobs get killed. Now, this is in a way an opportunity, right? Because if, you, if your algorithm can deal with the fact that it at some point has more machines, it's sometimes less, and sometimes the machines die and then they come back, well, you can deal with spot instances. You can run the stuff probably at a factor of 10 less money. But you need to have essentially fault tolerance. So what this shows you is that you need fault tolerance not just because your machines might die, but also because you might have highly variable resources. Likewise, for instance, if you run jobs on, let's say, Google servers, and I think it's probably the same pretty much everywhere else, well, if Larry Page wants to run his job, my job gets killed because his job has higher priorities. Okay. Um, so the specifics of the scheduling algorithms vary, but basically, if a production job uh, needs that resource and I'm just running an experiment, well, my jobs get killed. So this means you really want to have algorithms that can deal with variable load with large data, with big data, and with fairly unpredictable resources. Okay. Moo is going to show you a lot how to deal with that in the afternoons, and Marcus Weimer will show you the Microsoft way of doing this. And they're actually both very interesting ways. I mean, one of the Microsoft ways, because there's also Nayat, which I'm not going to go into much detail, but you might want to check it out. Okay. So how do you actually deal with you know, those jobs? Right? Because I mean, machine learning is not the first case where this happens, so we basically need to figure out how do we distribute you know, work and how do we distribute storage. So file systems were actually the first thing that people had to worry about. So if you have a whole bunch of disks and you have a single server, you probably have heard about RAID. Who has not heard about RAID before? So redundant array of inexpensive disks. So what you do is basically, let's say I have six disks, then I store the data on five of them, 
and use the sixth one as a checksum bit. Okay, fine. So that's essentially what's called rate five. So yeah, I use one of the disks as parity. Well, if I then lose one disk, I can essentially reconstruct all the data from the other basic n minus one disks. And you can immediately see that this is problematic because now you have no you know, safety anymore. So you need an operator to run very quickly and replace the failing disk and hope that he identifies it correctly. And then, you know, you rebuild things. So if you want to have more fault tolerance, you would, for instance, you know, have checksums with, you know, more than, uh, you would basically have error correcting codes with more than one, uh, you know, basically redundant piece of information. So um, there's actually a lot of nice information theoretic tools that you can just use right away, and that will solve it. Okay, um, the problem is that this is just a single machine. So if this machine dies, um, you still have an issue that basically everybody else, all the other machines that need this data are screwed. So um, what then basically happened, and this, so the big breakthrough was really um, the Google file system, and I'll show you in a moment how that works, is to start looking at the typical workloads that you have on the internet. You have bulk sequential writes. So this is like Alex uploads the machine learning summer school videos. That's, you know, 30 gigabytes per lecture at once being uploaded. Okay. Uh, we'll be generating probably about one and a half terabytes of data just in the next two weeks. You also might have bulk sequential reads. That's, for instance, somebody actually watching Tico's lecture in maybe two weeks' time. We don't have a lot of random writes, as in I'm not going to edit frame number 250 of this video. I'm not going to do that. Um, if then, I might just decide to, that maybe the last five minutes of my lecture were so horrible and I'm going to cut it out. But I'm not going to edit a particular frame. You might possibly have very high bandwidth requirements per file because maybe five people want to watch Zico's lecture at the same time. Or more or less approximately at the same time. And you want to make sure that Zico's lectures are always visible. Not just occasionally because uh, you don't want to get a well, please wait five minutes while we restore that file. Uh, notice when you actually go and want to watch the lecture. So this basically means you want to have high, high availability and high replication. So a couple of non-starters. There's something called Lustre. And basically it has amazingly high bandwidth. But basically, if a rack dies, you have a problem. Then there's something called cluster, which is sort of kind of like luster, AFS, NFS, whatever. They don't really paralyze, so don't bother. Okay, NFS, no file security, right? So this is how they started uh, with the Google file system, and then the Hadoop file system essentially cloned it. Um, you might argue whether the current Hadoop file system actually is superior to that paper from 10 years ago. Um, I'm not going to comment on that much further. But basically, here's what happens. You have, and this is essentially pre-sharding and so on, so there's, there's a lot of smarter designs that you could do nowadays. But what you basically have is you have a file system master. And that one contains you know, the namespace and everything. And if you look for a specific file, you then go, the master says, well, by the way, it's it, it sits some machine such and such, and it's that chunk. And then with that meta information, you go to that machine, to that chunk, and you read it. So these are these chunk servers, and they're, well, fairly dumb. I mean, all they do is they just have a lot of disks, and then you get that block, and you read it, and that's it. So the chunks are like 64 megabytes, for instance. This also means that if I want to write anything, I'll always have to edit at least a chunk of that size. So that basically means that random writes are non-starters. Random reads I can do, but they're possibly expensive. What you then do is you basically go 
and replicate those chunks. So the chunk servers actually do this automatically. And if you want to have higher bandwidth, well, you just make several copies of, the, of this file on more machines and automatically get more bandwidth. One of the big Achilles heels is that the master actually has to go and distribute, check faults, and rebalance. And if the master dies, well, you have a real problem. So what you might want to do if you want to find out what the latest and greatest is in terms of file system design, search for something called Colossus. I believe there are some papers by now written about that, Colossus and Spanner, which describes the, or is some idea of the latest uh, version of Google's file systems. And this would be an entire class in its own right, so I'm not going to go into detail here. Um, but basically, the, ba the idea is you have blocks. They are stored on a lot of dumb machines. And then you have some device which tells you where those blocks are. We'll see that very same pattern later on again. Um, and then, yeah, OK, the way how you actually go and write into it is, well, basically, the client writes into maybe one replica, and then it just that replica replicates further. Um, this picture here we'll see later on also in the context of our parameter server, where basically we go and interact with one of the servers, and that one then performs you know, further copies. So a lot of what you're seeing here will be translated to distributed inference algorithms, and we'll big steal and borrow some of the concepts and use them while in a new context. Okay. So as you see, this is the Achilles heel. And, but the good thing is you only need one write. Okay. So now that we sort of kind of figured out how we are going to store shed loads of data on large numbers of machines by basically you know, writing blocks and then having a essentially directory structure to tell us where those blocks are, we need to figure out how we're going to process things. So the first thing that you can do is you can think about MapReduce. So Everybody knows MapReduce, and at some point, people believe that MapReduce is the answer to all problems, especially in machine learning, which is a bad idea, but fine. OK, so let me show you what you can do. So let's say we have, you know, and it's, it's a really important tool, right? It's just that it doesn't solve all the problems in machine learning, right? So that's, you know. So, yeah. Um, so basically, <laughs> no, it, it's it, it's just funny that uh, sometimes the zealots are, uh, well, but basically the disciples are more more zealous than uh, you know the prophet, and this is a little bit what happened with you know MapReduce and Hadoop, uh, and if you then look at other places where MapReduce was invented, it's it's a tool, but it's one of several tools that people can use. Okay, so the good thing is that a lot of jobs are embarrassingly parallel. So, for instance, word counts, or you know, how much money did I make with my ads today, or you know, find all the spam emails. There are a lot of things that I can do, you know, in trivial parallel manner. So, and for that, map and reduce are actually really useful. So, map basically takes key value pairs. And the key might be just the document ID, and the values might be you know, the text in that document. And outputs new key value pairs, different numbers of them. So for instance, for documents, for word counts, it's going to emit a key value pair for every word that occurs in the document. Right, so it's going to create a large number of them. And then reduce takes key value pairs and aggregates them. So basically, map and reduce are really just two steps in a bipartite graph where one goes and transforms the input data, key value pairs, into other key value pairs. And then reduce is an operation that is actually commut commut uh, commutative and associative. So that's basically all it is. And since we have that, it's fairly easy to, you know, Paralyze this. It also means that if some of the machines die, 
I just give the data to some other machine and have it process it. And since likewise reduce is, you know, commutative and associative, I can, go, so in other words, the order in which I, in which I perform it doesn't matter, and I can reduce and then further reduce. Uh, it also means that I can basically move different sorts of the data around and aggregate and so on. Okay, so here's, for instance, what happens. You basically have the data being split up. It's being read by various workers, which perform the maps. And then, well, you go and basically, you know, write that local state to disk. And then workers go, possibly the same that we have here before, and they take the data that's been written locally to disk, and they reduce it. Okay, so this was the second one in those really milestone papers around 2003. And what you can see is here that we are basically exchanging data between two different processes by file I.O., which is highly robust and um, not so fast, right? Because you're basically now bound by the I.O. performance of the hard drives in your computer. It's a very primitive, highly scalable, but also not so amazingly effective way of doing things. Nonetheless, because it's so general, and since the interface is very, very simple, because you only need to support two operations, namely map and reduce, you can optimize the heck out of it. Okay. So that's basically map reduce. Let's look at a slightly more machine learning related example, for instance, gradient descent. So this is what Zeke already mentioned before. So basically we, what we have is we have an objective where we have a sum over a couple of loss functions, L of X, I, Y, I, and W, and a penalty. And the algorithm basically now goes as follows. Compute the gradient. So on each data point, via map of, you know, I and data, it goes and generates a gradient. It's now a long, typically very sparse vector. So for instance, on documents, it would only contain, you know, non-zero entries for you know, all the words and maybe word features that you can design on that document. And then you want to sum the gradient, and you can do that via reduce, and you reduce for each coordinate, because for each coordinate we now, now want to sum over all the instances that, you know, have that, you know, coordinate occurring. And then, in the end, you have some small auxiliary routine which performs this. And then you go and iterate again. Um, they're actually slightly more intelligent things than just performing a gradient descent step. So do not implement this. This is excruciatingly slow and it's a waste of machine time. But just to explain to you how you could do gradient descent in MapReduce, this is what you could do. And then there was this paper out of Stanford from I think around 2006, which pretty much said, well, all of machine learning is MapReduce. It's a very important paper because it actually showed that a lot of algorithms could be forced to fit into MapReduce. And at least if you didn't have any idea of how to solve them before, at least now you had a scalable algorithm. It's not necessarily the most efficient algorithm, but at least you could do it. Um, but yeah, by now there are much, much better tools out there, so don't. Um, so. I'm probably going to go like five minutes over time because I want to cover a few more things unless you are amazingly hungry. Who's, okay, good, so I guess everybody is willing to put up with me for another five minutes because we started late. Um, so let me tell you a, a few other ways how you can actually do the stream processing. So one thing is, for instance, what's called Dryad. So Dryad basically just is a logical extension of MapReduce. So MapReduce generates a bipartite data flow graph. We first send everything to the mappers, they generate stuff, then they send this to the reducers, and then we are done. So, well, you know, why not stop? You know, why stop at two? We can just have any directed acyclic graph. And this is actually very, very nice, what happened in Dryad, and I would say probably Dryad would have been a lot more popular 
had it been implemented in an open source platform. Um, it, it had a lot of really, really nice properties. For instance, how you construct graphs. And yeah, so let me quickly tell you a little bit how Dryad actually generates those graphs. Because it's kind of awkward if you have to define all the edges of your data flow. So the first thing that you can do is you can just say, well, hey, I want to have a lot of nodes. And then all you do is you just say, well, A to the N. Uh, OK, that gives us the first two examples, A and B. Now, if I want to have a lot of parallel pipelines where thing, things go from A to B, I just say you know, AS, which is this A to the N, and BS, which is B to the N. They're just you know, connected accordingly. Then you want to have a primitive for saying, well, everything connects to everything. So AS greater greater BS. So this thing here basically in, will generate a graph that looks just like MapReduce. Then you want to be able to fork things off. So this is now strictly different from what you could do with MapReduce, where you basically generate some data, and then you send it off to possibly two very different processes, which will do very different things. For instance, one which identifies whether you have spammers, and the other one which finds out how much money you made from the users. Okay. And then you can actually go and compose those structures. And if you look at this, you can basically see that you can you know, have constructions like everything goes to one central processing unit, and then it, it's you know, distributed again, or that you want to have parallel connections at the same time. So you can design a lot of really interesting graphs this way. So why would you want to programmatically des uh, describe this? Well, one of the reasons is that, well, computers tend to be really good at optimizing things. And they tend to be really good at optimizing things if you give them the information in a structured form. So for instance, what Dryad can do is if it sees that I have you know, data flow of this form, then maybe I can refine that graph and actually insert some intermediate elements to aggregate things and so on. So this is actually really neat because now you can optimize the data flow, the graph layout, all that for the server center that you have, as opposed to doing things just in general. So that's highly desirable. Um, so that's Dryad. And yeah, it's very unfortunate that it didn't do any better in practice than it did. And that's yeah, it had a lot to do with things not being open source. Um, then you could start asking, well, is there a simpler way of designing something like Dryad? And so this is basically what happened at Yahoo, because Yahoo didn't have Dryad. But some of the problems were very similar. And it actually wanted to have a real-time data flow system. S4 stat originally stood for Scalable Sponsored Search System, so hence S4 but it actually developed into something a lot more general. You basically want to have a directed acyclic graph, and you want to have data flowing through it, and you want to have nice scalability. So what you do is you basically um, use consistent hashing to decide how data is being routed between different machines. We'll get to consistent hashing a little bit later. But basically, you have a pool of machines, and the data essentially bounces between those machines in a through hash functions predefined manner. And this way, you virtually implement a directed acyclic graph. The only thing is that you need to worry about local state and so on, and that's, that makes it a little bit harder. Um, I'm really going to skip over this. Um, so I mean, basically, check, check S4 out. It's, it's a very, very neat thing. Um, unfortunately, most of the guys then went to basically, yeah. Well, stock trading companies, and that's when the commits to it stopped. Uh, Spark is probably currently the most popular distributed processing platform. Uh, no, this is not their official logo. Uh, but yeah. Um, basically, the idea goes as follows. So data is being transformed by processing, right? And so what you can then do is you basically have data. You have you know, one processing step. 
and you get some other data out of it. And then maybe you do something else with that and you get something else out of it. And so in the end, well, you get some you know, final optimization and inference result. So why not do the following thing to actually spell this out as a you know, data flow graph with what they call resilient distributed data sets, RDDs. So if you read Matei Zaharia's paper, you'll see RDDs showing up a lot. And he allows for rather much more powerful transformations and actions on the data than uh, MapReduce does. So if you think about it, Map and Reduce are basically the only, the only two transformations that MapReduce allows. Spark allows for this entire set, amongst which there is also map and reduce, right? So you can see map on the first line, then reduce is reduced by key. So you basically have a much richer API, which you can use to process data. You still inherit a lot of the nice properties of map reduce in terms of parallelism and load balancing and so on. And the other really ingenious and nice thing is that now since you basically have a driver that controls the entire control flow and execution, you can defer certain computations until you actually need them. So you can lazily invoke them, you can write checkpoints, and so this way it's actually fairly easy to design um, you know, balanced algorithms which you know, are way more efficient, and I think this pretty much speaks for itself. So this is a lot faster than what you can do in Hadoop. I mean, by now everybody is Hadoop bashing anyway, but uh, this was one of the first papers where, you know, they very resoundingly showed that, you know, you can actually do these things very efficiently. Okay. So I'm not going to talk anymore today about the parameter server. Um, if you go to parameterserver.org, you can already check out the sources. Mu is going to tell you more about this in the afternoon. And we'll get to talk a lot more about this tomorrow. And then we'll also start talking about machine learning algorithms and you know, basically how to use them for it. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>